Hi, I'm Julia Halevi. I'm the Provost and Academic Vice President at the Boston Architectural College, and I'm standing in for our wonderful President Ted Landsmark tonight, um, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but for a very good reason. He's receiving um, the Ellen S. Jackson Award for Excellence in Education at the Freedom House, uh, which champions, um, it's called the Champions of Freedom Award. And it's given annually to outstanding individuals, nonprofits, and corporations in recognition of their commitment to diversity, educational achievement, community development, and philanthropy, which touches the lives of so many of Boston's neighborhoods. So I think it's apt that Ted should get that, and we're very proud of him. On his behalf, and on behalf of the Boston Architectural College, I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to this wonderful lecture. Originally founded to honor Dean Cassieri's long service to the Boston Architectural College, the Cassieri Lecture is now part of our rich and illustrious student lecture series developed by BAC students and their advisors, Karen Nelson and Richard Griswold, and is sponsored by Atelier with special support for tonight's lecture from funds donated in and after 1994, and for the April 10th lecture by Michael Murphy, Alan Ricks, and Sierra Bainbridge, whose exhibit is opening tonight downstairs in the gallery from the Hideo Sasaki Foundation, and we hope you will visit the gallery this evening. I'd like to thank our students for bringing us this wonderful series. Uh, over the past m recent years, uh, they certainly picked up the pace and brought some of the best speakers in design to the BAC, and it's been a very exciting um, experience. We have had, for example, Steve Stefan Banish, Bjork Ingalls, Craig Dykers of Snohetta, Stefan Bublio, and Martha Schwartz, among others, just very recently. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Richard Griswold for all the work that he's done to support the students in Atelier, and the heads of programs, heads of schools, Karen Nelson of Architecture, Crandon Gustafson of Interior Design, Maria Bealta of Landscape Architecture, and Don Hunsaker of the School of Design Studies for their un, um, well, it says indefatigable, but I can never say the word. So. Um, <laughs> support of the students. <laughs> I'd also like to thank board members, our chair of our board, Russ Feldman, and Vice Chair Mark Pelletier, I think are among us, and Bill Parker, the secretary, as well as all the board members and overseers who have supported the BAC over the years. Um, and I'd especially like to um, recognize and honor Holly Kratzley. Did she make it down here? Guess not. <laughs> She'll get here later, and then I'll make her stand up. Um, she's our board uh, head of the Education Committee, and she received the Selfless Labor Award this evening upstairs in the library. Um, I am now going to ask Bill Box, who's standing in for Bernie Goba, um, who is chair of the Cassieri Lecture Committee, to come up and continue this. Welcome. Hi. Um, Bernie can't be here tonight. He's uh, recovering from knee surgery, unfortunately. He would love to be here. Bernie has, um, in, in his capacity as an alumni board member, has spearheaded the cashier lectureship for, I think, all of 20 years now. Um, uh, now, now that it is um, part of the series, but it continues to be um, spearheaded by the alumni board. Um, and we Thank you for your attendance here tonight. Thank you, Bill. Um, finally, I would really like to introduce Arlen Stewas, who's our atelier president, and Aniso Gilwayo, who's atelier secretary and member of the lecture series committee, who will introduce our wonderful speaker, Brendan McFarland. Hey everyone, um, my name is Anisu, I'm Secretary of the BAC um, Student Government, Atelier, and I'm in the Bachelor of Architecture program. Um, this year, Atelier made it a goal to build a world-class lecture series for the BAC community, and the lecture series members, including myself, Alan Kewas, uh, Julia Cudano, and Carla Mueller, with Karen Nelson, Head of Architecture, have worked to make this a reality. Uh, but here tonight, we're hitting a new height, and we would not have made it possible without the Cassieri Lecture Committee, which honors longtime dean of the BAC, Angelo Cassieri, for whom this lecture series is named. Uh, following this talk, please join us downstairs 
there's a reception, and tomorrow at noon, advanced students have been invited for an in-depth discussion with Senator McFarlane. Um, and you guys will learn about how these works become the reality. Thanks. I'm Arlen Stewas. I'm currently the past president of Atelier, and I'm in the <laughs> Bachelor of Arts program at the BAC, and also lucky to be a part of the Student Lecture Series Committee. Brennan McFarlane wrote, Stories are often an aspect that remains untold, or hidden behind our projects. Yet we feel that they are the reason that gives depth to certain projects. Going beyond just what we see, they are often the very motor to projects. In his lecture, Brennan will share and explain these stories behind his work, how they have developed and given form and meaning. Brennan McFarlane was born in New Zealand and received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Southern California Institute of Architecture and his Master's degree of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design. He has held teaching positions at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London and the École Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris and at SIARC. Jacob McFarland is an architectural Jacob and McFarland is an architectural firm based in Paris, France. Its work explores digital technology both as a conceptual consideration and as a means of fabrication, using new materials and as a possibility to create a more flexible, responsive, and immediate environment. On the BAC Study Abroad program in Paris, we were lucky enough to see the restaurants of Georges and the Pompidou Center the interiors of the Florence Lowy Bookstore, and the Docs Project, which concludes a fashion and design center. When we visited the office, we saw the early stages of the apartments projects in Paris, which the 2009 BAC Paris got a tour of. Current projects include, include the Euronews headquarters in Lyon, the new FRAC Architecture Exhibition Center in New Orleans, I'm sorry, in Orleans, a dance and music conservatory in noisy le -Sec, and the High School of Art and Communication of Pau. Jacob and McFarland projects have been exhibited have been sorry have been exhibited at the Victoria and Albert Museum, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Architecture in Moscow, Artist Space in New York, Carnegie Mellon, the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, at the MOCA in LA, the Pompidou Center, the Pavilion des Arsenal in Paris, and the Orleans Arca Lab. International Architectural Exhibition and Conferences, and the Venice Architecture Biennale. Please give, please give your warmest welcome. Please give your warmest BAC welcome to Brendan McFarland. Thank you for the introduction. I, uh, it, very much the idea of stories struck me as being a, an extension of that, that first meeting with the students, uh, in the sense of. Uh, Stories are somehow the part that we don't see behind architecture, and yet the part which I've always found the most significant and the most interesting, and it's what explains uh, eventually how something comes about. And I think for architecture students, again, that's a, that's a really fundamental issue. It's not about a form in a publication. It's uh, ultimately about what goes on behind the scenes, and what the hidden dimension of a project is. It's what people are thinking about, it's what a city makes as a, an urban rule, let's say, which is an invisible one, uh, which is maybe picked up by an architect or not. Uh, um, it's all of these aspects, anyway, which I think are very important. And somehow in our work uh, of Jacob and McFarlane, we're interested in the invisible. We're interested in traces. We're interested in, in uh, somehow materializing things or forces, let's say, which are not necessarily visible in the first uh, vision, but um, making those apparent. And we're very interested in things that exist as conditions. Um, I've always been an architect which is not interested in uh, imposing an architecture on a site or a situation. I think a fundamental question in architecture is also, do we even need a an architectural project in some instances? Maybe not. So it's not about producing all the time. It's about uh, thinking about what we're doing first. 
and trying to come up with a solution which is uh, which has resonance, which has meaning, which has um, in a way reason. And I think the best way in which for me to then describe that to you is obviously pre presenting a little bit uh, the different projects. So what I'm going to do is take you through a really a beginning to um, the more recent work and some of the earlier projects and we're going to sort of meander uh, a little bit and, uh, and we'll see what happens. That wasn't meant to happen, but there we are. I wanted to show you this. There's only two images of Restaurant George, but at least it gives you a, 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 a memory or a place where we were around uh, 1999-2000. Um, we made a project on the top of Centre Georges Pompidou, uh, which uh, later became known as George, the restaurant. Uh, and it was a project where we imagined uh, uh, it wasn't so much of a restaurant as a place where it was like a miniature city almost inside the, the, the Centre Pompidou. The incredible thing about Centre Pompidou is that it had really Im been, been imagined. I, I love Jean Prouvé's, um, exp um, what he had to say about uh, Centre Pompidou because he was on the jury for choosing the project. And he described it as des étagères. Now, des étagères in French is, is uh, in English, uh, sorry, is, a, is, a, is, is like a bookcase. It's like a shelving system. And the ideal uh, behind, the ideal idea in a way behind the Pompidou was that in this shelving system uh, by Renzo Piano and Rogers, uh, the shelving system actually was a series of levels of floors into which one could house exhibits, temporary performance, theatres, cinemas, libraries, cafes, the works. And it would be an ongoing, changing, uh, you know, uh, scape of, of events and exhibitions, etc. And really all you had then was it was really like a kind of almost like, um, well, uh, it was a system. It was a systematic thing. It was a series of platforms that really were empty. And... Uh, our project came around for all sorts of reasons, but one primarily was that uh, by the year 2000, the building was considered to be a, um, a patrimoine, uh, part of the patrimoine, uh, and it was uh, completely a, a historic monument, and uh, everything about it had to be preserved, which was the irony of the whole thing. In 72, in as we well remember, it was hated and detested, and there was a lot of people that would have loved to have actually demolished it. But, uh, but the point is that in the preservation of the whole building, or this idea that you couldn't do anything with it now, uh, the only thing we could work with was really the floor. So, uh, and s that really wasn't so much of a problem for us, but we imagined, any, however, anyway, a floor into, into which four elements were introduced, uh, which became the modules or the, uh, the deformations of the floor, which in this case was an aluminium floor, a very lightweight floor. And in these deformations, we have housing uh, for different programs. So in a sense, it's kind of like four boxes within a larger box, if I kind of simplify it grotesquely. Uh, this is the, was the, the, the bathroom element, uh, or the, 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 the functions for uh, the uh, toilets. Uh, this, of course, was the, the video bar. In the back was a huge kitchen, etc. And there was a third, fourth element, which was um, a VF, VIP dining area. But the point was that here we started playing with the idea of a kind of uh, deformation of the floor and a deformation. We played very much with the idea of a deformation of the, uh, of the lattice or the grid of Pompidou, which was in a 180 by 180 by 180 module, which had been set up by Piano Rogers <coughs> as being the guiding principle and as a three dimensional guiding structure principle for the primary structure, the secondary structure, uh, the floor slabs, etc. And for us, that seemed one of the most interesting things to actually take that, 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 that matrix, deform it, and in so doing, introduce uh, a programmatic, new programmatic elements. The intention of all of that, to say, was that uh, we wanted to create something which, at w on the one hand, belonged to, the, in a way, the DNA of the building, the genetic code of the, of the building, but actually became something else, something new. Um, so if I 
move on. Um, uh, there's this, a project that followed quickly after that was a project uh, called the Library by Florent, uh, for Florence Lowy, which was a library, a very tiny library in Paris, um, and uh, of, of books uh, conceptualized and fabricated by artists. And it's an extraordinary collect collection. She had spent time living and working in New York in, uh, in, and working in the, in the uh, library in New York, the small bookshop, Books by Artists, um, uh, in Soho, I believe. And um, she had come back to Paris uh, and uh, contacted her office and said, listen, I have a really, really tiny budget. I don't know if you want to do it, but I have a space in the Marais and into which I want to put books and I also want to stock books. And so we had something like, um, I think from memory, a 60 meter space, um, which included another space, et cetera, behind. And we had this problem of doing like everything in one space, introducing the public, having the private storeroom, et cetera. So we finally, after kind of throwing around the project and actually one in frustration, thinking that we probably couldn't come up with an idea except uh, telling her that the best thing was to go to Ikea and buy bookshelves, yeah. uh, was to say that, well, no, hang on, why don't we imagine actually no books and we just build everything out of the books? So we imagined, in fact, the old building, the old volume of the building, which is an 18th century building, completely filled with books. And in this, in, and in this case, we imagined a, a a virtual uh, character that opens the, sto the, the door and through the movement of his body uh, er erodes into this gigantic volumetric stack of books and creates in this kind of negative cutout a spatial condition which becomes the circulation which becomes invariably this idea of well why don't we then instead of taking the books and making the bookshelves then we take the bookshelves and then fill the bookshelves with the books and somehow get the volumetric study back. So in those three sketches, which uh, is almost a political move, I realize today, I was saying that earlier in the day, to put a sketch, a uh, handmade sketch, uh, up on a board here, uh, but of course I do it deliberately. Here is the development of the project. As we went through this project, which was taking the mass, we took uh, this, these three things out, which we called the totems. And then within the totems, we went through a process called coring, like you would do with an apple, uh, uh, and produced, this is a backward movement, because of course this is what we came from, produced ultimately uh, in the plan, three, the three totem elements here, here, and here, the, the door being here these pieces. And these pieces uh, ultimately became, the, this is the public space with the books around the edge. And the inside of two of these became the storage rooms, the private space. So the bookshelf that was both public on one side and private storeroom on the other became one in the same uh, spatial gesture, one in the same volume. And in a way, the uh, remplissage or the filling up of the, of the shelf became the final skin uh, of the pieces. So this is inside one of those uh, totems where we put the books, of course. And what was very beautiful about this, the system or the non-system was that books on, on the side, could, or spaces sometimes, of course, would be seen between the public and the private and vice versa. So um, uh, here is part of the collection. Uh, this is the 18th century, uh, uh, night, well, 18th century facade. Uh, we're very near Musée Picasso here with this piece. And the students, of course, uh, on the trip to Paris had, uh, saw this from, uh, from, from back. Um, another image, etc. Um, all I can say is that ideas of this uh, finally, of course, also um, bled, uh, to use another expression, I guess, uh, across into a, a project called 100 Logements, which is a social housing uh, project in Paris. Now, the French take their social housing very seriously, and it's probably the heart of the French architectural production in the sense that it's... Um, it's, it's uh, the, the idea of housing people, building, making an, arch creating architecture for housing people 
at a medium or low cost is, is, is an effort, is like has always been a major effort and is in a sense definitely part of being tested as an architect in France. Um, and I think also people are always, always looking, or the French culture is always looking for new ways to evolve social housing as society changes, as it evolves, as it has new expectations, etc. What we produced here was, um, for the first time in, uh, in France, we had, uh, or certainly Paris, we had new sustainable rules that came into the city. And so we produced what became the first social housing under sustainable uh, rules, and these are stereolithic models, of uh, a principle that we, of course, had been using on the project for Florence Lowy, which, which was this eroding of a gigantic urban matrix. In this case, what happened now was that what we imagined with Florence had been the, the, the shelves for books. We thought, uh, but it was kind of in, a, in an extremely circuitous route conceptually. What we would take was, an, uh, was, a, was a matrix of the city. Um, and if I explain it a bit more carefully, you can see on the top, I'm just jumping backwards and forwards between different subjects. All of this is solar panel uh, rooftop. What became a major uh, a source of the project was that we could only build within certain areas of the site. Parts of the site were polluted land. Parts of the site, we had about eight ancient trees which belonged to an earlier uh, hospital, which was built on the site, etc. There was about eight, in a way, get what you'd call givens uh, uh, or conditions. What that led us to was that finally, after analyzing all of that, we realized that we could actually probably not produce 100 large ones. We could probably produce maybe, I don't know, 85. Uh, and we had some huge conditions of, of creating on the site. And ultimately, what we did was we then applied the methodology of the, the bookshop on an urban scale, as I said, and imagined the whole s uh, structure of the building as a, as a series of platforms. And the walls holding those platforms, again, as this matrix, uh, uh, which becomes a, it's a concrete, in this case, it's a concrete floor as well as a concrete wall. And by eroding, in a way, eroding the conditions out of the matrix, taking in a way all of these problem issues, including a house mania and setback, et cetera, which, were which the city, urban rules of the city asked for, as well, I mean, I could go on and on. Anyway, there's a, there's a whole series of urban views across the site that we had to leave open. Anyway, eroding into that matrix, we end up with um, this project. And so what it is, is in fact, it leads to a very, very simple project, which is uh, all of the apartments are, as the French say, traversant meaning that they open on both sides. We decided uh, in th for sustainable reasons that we didn't want to air condition anything. So what normally would be a closed circulation system or core in each of these build uh, parts uh, of the building, uh, in France, we were able to find uh, uh, a way around the rules, which led us to open all of the circulation systems. So we treated all of the circulations really as, a, as, a, as part of the uh, a, a large balcony which people could sit on and talk to each other. Um, so there's a great uh, rationality in terms of the plan, but where it is, of course, irrational is this edge line. Um, this is just going through some of the issues of sustainability. We produce over 60% of the hot water for the building uh, in terms of the, the use of bathroom water. Um, uh, through solar, th uh, thermal solar panels. And anyway, there's a whole lot of other issues going on here. And we produce, we produce, we, uh, we made a, a thing called a, a, um, a Jardin de Hiver, which in this case is a plastic curtain, which we developed with a Dutch company, which is made out of a, um, as you can see here, it's a new plastic, which comes out of the marine industry which is, uh, has a long life and extremely performant. And what we can do, what we do in, in wintertime is all of the buildings become closed up uh, in a, you know, a communal move of closing up the, the buildings. And everyone opens up the secondary or the primary uh, walls, 
the doors, etc., open onto the space. So the space becomes a heated space. It becomes an outdoor space and becomes an extension. So in fact, what becomes um, a 45 meter squared apartment actually becomes 60. And that's what is probably one of the most interesting aspects about the building as well, is that we were able to give people uh, for the same price, which becomes a huge argument, because it all comes down to finance, because we're within social housing, we were able to make for them uh, a space which is very, very interesting in summertime, in summertime. catching myself. In wintertime, it uh, becomes a very, very interesting space, and a space in which people live. And ultimately, if we go around the building, we can see a wee bit about this. This is a, a version which, where it's closed up, ready for wintertime. And this is held down on the floor. There's a rail uh, brought into the concrete system. The interiors are extremely simple because, as I said, it's, it's, it's pretty low budget. Um, and this is one of the owners, or one of the renters, I should say, uh, unfolding, folding the, the screen, a couple. Uh, these are the balconies, somehow how they're used. So they're often quite personalized spaces. Um, we have uh, the ground floor of the social housing units is all about 21 apartments for heavily handicapped people, very heavily handi handicapped, handicapped people. So we have a permanent uh, nurse uh, permanently there on site. And that comes out through an urban rule which said that the, uh, the history of the site was a hospital site and then a social uh, uh, in this part of the city is, is socialist and the urban rules said that we, if we replaced the hospital with housing, part of the housing still had to cater for people needing hospital help. So there's a kind of an urban condition, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, uh, a rule about the site which of course led to I think also issues of mixity which are very interesting. Um, we have a lot of young families there uh, and older people and as well as people with very serious debilitation. So here on the ground floor uh, the idea here of course was to make the whole site uh, which had been uh, quite lumpy or, or hilly was to make one datum running right through the site and we have paths which are uh, accessible that go right through the three buildings uh, for, of course, handicapped people uh, to or you know people with different uh, dis different uh, physical handicaps uh, that can easily move and enjoy the, this garden space, which is a communal garden space and was, is shared by everyone. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, another project that we worked on a number of years ago. Uh, was a very interesting condition in Paris. Uh, Place de la Concorde is just here. It's a, uh, um, a very sort of strange, oops, sorry, uh, very strange condition in the sense that uh, w we have a site or a space that is inward looking into a couple of courtyards. And uh, Ricca Foundation, which is a, a very interesting foundation in France, they really are running uh, an award every year for um, uh, choosing uh, a series of artists that will go on and uh, for a year have an atelier in New York and produce a piece of art that will be bought back by the Centre Pompidou and will be shown to the public at the Centre Pompidou. So it's an extraordinary foundation. It's Ricca, the same people of course producing pastis, uh, uh, but they have a, a very strong patronage of the arts in, in France. And so here we were given the job of actually creating for them a space uh, for artists uh, and what we imagined really was a, a box within a box, it's an existing condition. And we gave in this case, a, a twenty. we made a, a wall which is about 25 centimeters away from the existing wall and in that new condition of wall it became possible for artists to make all sorts of interventions cut into that, uh, introduce uh, uh, virtual technology, etc. So it's quite a, in a way the big move is a very simple move, uh, which are often the best moves I think, and then we produce this thing which was the bar based on a metaphor of the sun, of the Marseille, 
And again, it's this matrix, this, this, this carved away matrix, which was a play on the idea that uh, it really became a kind of a, a series of boxes of bottles, which in this case, it's the one moment in the foundation, which is a kind of very ludic space, which is what the foundation uses to promote uh, design, design, the design of their bottles and uh, new bottles, new design pieces which are coming out every year. So it's a very interesting, Ricard is a very interesting mark in France because they've had this strong interest in terms of working with artists and designers for a long time and, uh, and, and quite an interesting group to work with. This is, a, this is a um, competition in San Malo that we lost, but we always like to present it because it's good to present lost things, I think. Uh, if not to cry, to, to for, well, for all sorts of reasons, I guess. Uh, this is the TGV as it arrives. If you've ever been to San Malo, it's, of course, it's an, an, a wonderful uh, town on the, uh, on, the, on the coast in France, heavily bombed uh, during the war but heavily restored as well. Uh, uh, and um, what you had here, well, it was an island at one point. And it was an isthmus that uh, developed, you know, uh, I think in the Middle Ages uh, here. And all of this was sea. And then over the years, of course, this has got more and more filled, filled with stuff. Um, the train station, of course, just came to here. And you had, then you had this kind of very strange way of getting to the, the, the semi-island or eventually actually walking a long way from the train station. So all of that went on for, an, uh, I would assume, sort of 150 years of, of, uh, of uh, tourists having to you know, uh, walk this long, long, long distance to the, to the town. What happened was there was a competition, still does in a way, I'm not really making an exception for that, but uh, the train station has changed recently, new TGV station, or the TGV arrives here of course now, so that changed the, the station. And, um, and then there was a competition recently for a Mediatek, but a Mediatek which housed also a collection of um, uh, books of uh, Jules Verne and some quite, quite, quite extraordinary collection of uh, sea uh, voyage, uh, books of uh, travel on uh, the sea uh, and different um, French by French authors as well as um, a, cl a strong collection of um, uh, what the French call bande dessinée, which are uh, cartoon books, right? C uh, a collection of cartoon work. And so here was an interesting, as well as I should say, uh, there's um, a, thi a thing which is like a biennale of uh, Bidi, bande dessinée, in San Malo, which has become world famous. So what they wanted to do was introduce a Mediatek, as well as actually three cinemas that eventually would be linked into this, what had become a world famous Biennale for uh, uh, cartoon art, which of course, as you know, in Europe, it's taken very, very seriously and has become even more institutionalized in the last couple of years. And so uh, our site is here. If we go on, this is the TGV station as it arrives. And the problem was to really create a building in this area. What we proposed was to actually take, imagine the building as a, as a, as a, as a Mediatek that you, you uh, walked up into. You walked along the piece, really like a bridge, and then you came down through the cinema complex uh, down below. The intention there, of course, was to lift the whole building up and open a view, completely transparent view, underneath the building and out towards the city of San Malo. So this is the piece, the uh, Mediatek, this is all of these kind of box-like or, or uh, you know, um, uh, kind of bad skin condition <laughs> is, 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 is are, uh, windows that look, uh, bring light in, windows that also correspond with different themes within the Mediatek that we were asked to respond to. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, Kant, which is like a, uh, um, tales for children, was one of them. Each, anyway, each of them has a thematic uh, reason for each of those. And then windows that look down onto the fl floor, and of course windows bringing light in from above. And this is the eventual thing, is that we imagine this kind of marine uh, landscape taking what uh, San Malo is very famous for these, this granite material, which is absolutely fantastic, and uh, and creating a, a, in a way this kind of virtual uh, sea 
uh, underneath the building, which of course becomes a kind of an esplanade for people walking from the train station and back out to the city. And what happens is that that is the church of San Malo in the distance, and which really is the reason why we wanted to lift the whole thing up above the city. Um, the Docks on Seine, which is a, a project in Paris, of course, uh, and it's what's interesting here is that I mean, it's, a, it's a complex piece now because we're getting into, um, into projects now, where for us for the first time it was an infrastructural piece. We've never worked with the city really before and it was really a, a first experience in this, in, in this sense. So all of a sudden they're complex because they're dealing with a lot of issues in this context. They're dealing with boats pulling up alongside. They're dealing with uh, bicyclists, uh, roller skaters, uh, you know, ambulances, uh, f you know, um, firemen using this hole underneath of, of a building. They're dealing with pieces, office workers in the back here needing to come through the building and down to the boat or come down to a bicycle on the lower level or, co or come down through this. They're dealing with all of, the, all of the movement, the flux of people walking along the river, bicycling along the river, taking boats along the river, and then cars coming in behind, dropping goods, etc., into the building. This, all of the concrete stuff is not us. All of the green stuff, of course, is the later addition that we called the plug over. The concrete stuff has a history, and so I'll present it to you now. It's one of the earlier reinforced concrete buildings in the world. It's 1907. It's not the earliest because the French were doing uh, experiments, but very early crew prototype experiments in the 1860s, 70s. But um, it's an important, it's an, really pr probably one of the major important uh, materializations of those experiments. We're talking about 1907. We're talking about an engineer, not an architect that came to Chicago, that spent time in the 1890s in Chicago studying steel uh, architecture, coming back to France knowing full well that he wouldn't probably be making it in steel but actually using concrete, which of course the French started to perfect earlier and became very much involved in, 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 in constructions like this, but for him this was one of the first. So these are early images of the building. As you can see, the way of building it is fantastically crude. All of this is wooden scaffolding. Um, there, of course, here in the foreground you have people playing, horses peeing, uh, you know, life goes on. It's in 19th century meets, uh, you know, the beginnings of the 20th century, and it's mad. You have a factory condition, you have, uh, so, and Paris at this point is still a, a very, somehow a very quiet city in a way. But what's going on now is the building's finished here, you have uh, trucks, which are boats, pulled up alongside with all the goods, you have cranes invented by Eiffel dropping down to that uh, level with little men inside them, I'll show you them later, that are pulling those goods into the building. So the whole thing, you know, I was talking about Pompidou as an etagere, as a bookshelf. Here's, here's an early version of Pompidou, to be quite frank. Um, here's this guy operating the, tr the, the crane, pulling up sacks of rice. Maybe these guys are just here for the photo, we don't know. But this roof condition, of course, and it's, uh, the rails, the, the, the roof condition remains. All of the steel system, of course, disappears by the time we get to the site. Um, uh, an early 19th, uh, I should say late 19th, what am I saying? An early 20th century image of the, of the site. Austerlitz train station. So major, major movement in and out of the city going on here. But just a wee bit further along, we have uh, Notre Dame. So we're right in the heart of the city. This building was detested by the French in 1907. Uh, it, in 1970, it was still detested by the French. <laughs> uh, um, but in fact, the building is a prototype for the rest of the world. It, it's remarkable. And when we were given the competition in uh, what was it, in 2006, something like this, 2005, I can't remember the exact date. 
they actually wrote on the text, uh, this is the city of Paris, they wrote on the text, you can, uh, you can destroy the building or you can keep it, which is fantastic because we thought, well, hang on, wait, but this is uh, history, you know? It's a, it's a major prototype for the world. Why would you destroy this thing? So that was one aspect as to why we kept it. The other one, uh, or we proposed to keep it in the competition brief. The other one, of course, was sustainable reasons. It's a huge, massive piece of infrastructure. What do you do with all of that concrete? If you do want to get rid of it, where do you put it? Um, and isn't it useful? And the other thing, of course, is that this is what it looked like. So people were still convinced that it was actually worth getting rid of because certainly it wasn't the most beautiful thing on earth. But all you had to do was really visit the spaces and see that you had a great floor to ceiling height of like 420, which is fantastic. And we knew that if we built this today, of course, economists and economy being on what it is today to build, all of that would have to come down to 260 or 250. So we would all the arguments of making a, an atelier condition or an exhibition, potential exhibition space in this building, uh, if we destroyed it, of course, would have been lost. So um, this is jumping, uh, jumping forward to some degree, but this is what happened. I'll just jump back. We found in the project is that, interestingly enough, there was, an, uh, there was a rhythm, uh, which we didn't really get at first, but it is 10 meters, 7.5 meters, four times, and then it goes back to a 10 meter increment. And these were the areas where the cranes were on the 10 meter ones. Um, and uh, of course, by what we wanted to do with the condition was imagine, uh, we knew the city told us we could go up one level, we could go out about the same over the river, we can go a wee bit out the back. Those are some of the urban conditions. So we became interested in a lot of things all at once because uh, projects never happen in one way, there for us, it's a huge synthesis of different kinds of information. Um, and I think anyway, for most architects, of course. In this case, it was a, what we had was a building uh, uh, envelope, a buildable building envelope, which seemed very interesting to us. We had a problem of a building which has nev had never been entered by the public, completely disconnected from its site. If it was a boat pulling up, of course, historically it was interesting. You had a steam train running along the back and going all the way to Musée d'Orsay. You had horse and cart. You had all of this technology, this 19th century technology on the, on the front, and then almost uh, 20th century, I should say. And then on the back, you had a 19th century or earlier horse and cart taking the goods out to Paris. So it was a building of dichotomies. It was a building of a transition between one kind of epoch and another. So we knew we were also now in a new uh, period, you know, we were in, a, in, a, in, an, in an age, a numeric age, and how could you respond to a building which had already ridden out, was on a cusp between already two different ages? S and what was the age we were living in now, and what would that structure, or what would that new architecture be in relationship to this? So, of course, that, that becomes one interesting question. Another one is because it's divided from its site, what can you do to link it back into the city or bring the city into the thing? So we started looking at a lot of conditions of how the reeve or the, the quay comes down to the water, historically in Paris. Fantastic urban conditions exist, wonderful precedents. And so we wondered about actually imagining a staircase that where people, the, the building, it had to be an infrastructure thing, we thought, and it had to link into the rest of Paris. So we imagined, a, uh, again, a kind of a, a walkway that would take people up through the building, get to this terrace, which, without telling you more, it was an, an amazing discovery to come up onto that and discover this huge, flat, terrain-like uh, uh, space in the middle of Paris. Get, up, get people up to that and then actually take them back down and then imagine them to keep on walking. So it was really about that as a movement. And then it also had to be about this movement. Because the city imposed on us that these breaks in the building also had to link to a very famous church somewhere in the back and had to bring people back from all of this area in the back. It's not an accident that you're seeing a lot of cranes. All of this area in the last 15 years of Paris has been, become a huge job site of basically office in this area, but then residential all through the back area. So the building the city hoped would become like um, a gateway 
we're going from what the river was one, of course, one Cartier, and this becomes the edge of this new or this area here. So um, anyway, jumping ahead. So what we did with the rhythm of the building was to then take a 2.5 meter increment horizontally, which of course brought together the, the, the issue of the 10 and the 7.5. And by doing that, we wanted to introduce a lineal movement uh, instead of a transverse movement historically related because of this issue of tying the building into a circulation system, an imaginary circulation system of moving along the river. And so we introduced this thing called an arborescent system where we went from a point to a line to seven lines. And by doing that, we could then produce a volume. And the volume becomes then the plug over. Um, and what was interesting here was then that we could saddlebag, in a way, the building with all of the circulation going up on the side of the building, getting you to a, a major, uh, what really we talked about as a, a piazza, a, as, a, as, a, as a new public plus place, uh, but above the city, uh, using the roof of an existing building as a, as a new space for architecture. And uh, we imagined then a series of programs that would open onto that, etc. Um, so this really became the materialization of the structure. It's a, it's a, it's a structure which is both uh, uh, um, surface, volumetric program, circulation, in a sense all in one. Um, it both relates to its historical structural precedent and proposes a new thing as well. But at the same time, all the lines of force of the new imposed structure sit or saddlebag perfectly over the existing condition. So on the one hand, we have very important structural arguments as to how we're bringing those lines of force down through the building, but at the same time, deforming them for different programmatic uses. So these are just different, uh, different images of different uh, times through the project. Uh, different, you know, um, uh, during the competition, just after the competition, uh, developing the, the different uh, parts of the building. The insides of the building, so, you know, you had this uh, grid, this wonderful series of columns, uh, concrete columns, and then what it did was it le led us to free up completely the different pieces of program, which become extremely simple and secondary boxes within this larger um, plug over. But it's sometime, sometimes those secondary boxes come and touch the edge of the plug over. Um, and what's important, I, I think, here is to say, you know, you can see how it links into the city through the edge here, how that di famous diagonal comes through and out through the building and then takes you down through a staircase here. There's another major staircase here. And then these are the staircases over the river. And then there's a very big plaza here with handicapped access at this end of the building. So uh, the platform really is this gigantic space. Um, and as we move up through it, we have this huge exhibition space in the middle of the building. And then all of the uh, fire stairs are uh, on the back part. So this is public staircases. And then in the same manner, but much more simply uh, uh, woven into the building are the fire stair requirements, security stair requirements. The roof space uh, with different volumetry conditions, you know, without going into the different programs, views. And then that's kind of interesting as a section because you get an idea really where topographically the piece sits in relationship to the river and how it sits over the river, because we have a really a fantastic chance here too, because by keeping the structure, we knew that you know, if we ever got rid of the structure, the chances of the city would have gone through two or three steps and said, hey, by the way, guys, you need to be here for your building. It's, it's just as obvious. Um, uh, although no one ever said that, of course. And so by keeping the existing building, we knew that by then building out or blowing out deforming out over the river and uh, introducing the public on that r edge so that the uh, public are out over the water, which is a really unique experience in Paris. Uh, we could do that because there was this existing condition. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's one thing leading to another, on enveloping into a, one, from one thing to another, which I think is quite important. Um, anyway, these are different, you know, going through the, from the virtual imagery 
uh, deciding on how the structures are put together, deciding that these major 16.8 centimeter tubes are put every 2.5 meters, that deciding this 14.8 centimeter diameter is a secondary element. So that what happens is where, what's very, a very nice thing in chance is that also we're building this with a workshop called Eiffel, which is the same family that, of course, are descendants from Eiffel Tower. And so that was a very interesting situation because we also always made this joke about building a horizontal Eiffel Tower uh, along the river. These are the glasses, the panes of glass before they go up into the structure. Uh, boats, so we, what we did in this case was we, we inversed the historical uh, rule. Instead of boats uh, you know, downloading their goods, now they were downloading a new architectural condition over an existing, con uh, in an, in an existing one. And I like that. I think that historically, I think there's something quite wonderful about that. So from the boat where we're putting, we have cranes, and we're putting in place gradually the structure as an evolving, growing structure onto the existing building here, and gradually putting in the planes of glass at the same time. Things had to move amazingly fast, and we did this, I, it was about nine months uh, in putting it all in place. So it's, this is the finished condition. The city of finance is here. Ministry of Finance, uh, the library uh, of uh, Perret is uh, uh, in the back. Um, Perrault is in the back, Dominic. Uh, okay. Um, different views along the edge. This is a view giving some idea of the roof condition. All of this is real landscape on the roof, on the, on the top of it. And we always imagined why, because there was a number of reasons why. The, the city a long time ago had actually proposed to demolish the building and make a lineal park on the lower floor. And we thought it would be quite interesting that we, could we not just take the park and imagine this is a, a real park as well as a virtual one being the, the glass. So that was, that was part of the condition. Other, of course, there's other sustainable reasons which I don't need to go into as to why a roof is interesting to make uh, as a green, a green living surface. Um, okay. And at night, uh, you working with a light artist, Jan Casali, uh, we developed this uh, uh, quite a spectacular lighting system um, that lights the building in a view, different view. All of the wood is, again, for, it's uh, oak, French oak. So it's a, uh, sustainably speaking, the, uh, the arguments are very, are very good. Um, a view up from up on the terrace, a view on the terrace, looking around, looking. Keep on moving around. And this is in the plug over. And the space of that. So we have some quite spectacular spaces. And then on the lower level, all of this is, uh, uh, well, for the moment, we uh, will be opening finally this year after a delay of four years, which is extraordinary. Uh, uh, and. Uh, There'll be a whole series. The, I, the, the, the subtext of the site is, the title is The Docks, Les Docks, and the subtitle is uh, uh, City of Fashion and Design, hence the, in the introduction talking about that. It was the idea of the competition, was to bring, if, if bringing together two areas that is very close to the French, uh, two areas of, of, cult, uh, of creativity, that they, there would be synergy that would be created out of that, which are going to be extremely interesting for the uh, creativity in France. And I think already that started to happen on this site. We have uh, this uh, library here is a library for students of France's top fashion school, uh, the Institute of Fran uh, Francais de la Mode which is an exceptional, uh, exceptional situation for them, students uh, from around the world. Uh, and all of the curriculum is in English, which is extraordinary, you know, and that's already a major move for, for the French. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the exhibits of many exhibits that have been inside the building, mostly design orientated. Uh, this is the media tech I was telling you about, use around that. Uh, inside the, l uh, the lecture uh, hall for the students, which looks out onto the boulevard. Uh, from the boulevard, looking back into the, at this end of the building, it's the Institut Francais de la Mode that I was telling you about. Okay. So, 
And then uh, the docks of Lyon. Um, it's about two o'clock in the morning for me now. <laughs> but the water would be great. Uh, so docks of Lyon in, in Lyon, of course. Now, Lyon is an amazing city. That's fantastic. Uh, Lyon is an amazing city. Uh, I don't need to say that because I think you guys seem to be pretty well traveled. And uh, it's a city really worth seeing in France. It's, um, it's a bit of a sleeping beauty. It's not. You, know, you, can't, you couldn't possibly say that to the mayor of Lyon. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's a bit of a sleeping beauty in the sense that it's, it's I mean, the condition, the city is phenomenal. It made most of its money through textile, right? And uh, it made most of its architectural moves in the, eight, I would say the 18th, maybe the 17th, but 18th, essentially 18th, 19th century. Its, uh, it, it's precedents in terms of architecture rely heavily on the Italian Renaissance. Uh, its site, though, is phenomenal. You have the Rhone and the Seine, two rivers that converge, the Blue and the Grey rivers, and there's that famous photo at the end uh, of, a, of a space, as a, of a peninsula, which is called the confluence, and it's the confluence between the murky and the clear waters. So you would have seen that photo a number of times, I think. So here, looking at this piece, it's called the confluence, and it's this whole area which is extremely interesting, which is what we're going to look at now. The old city finishes here. This is the heart and a series of wonderful plus, which are uh, Renaissance plus. You can find that you know, it's, the precedents in Italy are, are, are extraordinary. But in this case, unlike Italy, maybe in Verona you have a similar condition, but uh, where you occasionally see out to a piece of uh, to a topographic condition which is quite steep and dramatic. Here it's really quite uh, phenomenal. You get, uh, you, 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 know, you get that jumping conditions where you get the primary the, 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 the first uh, perspective and then the third, and you miss the second because of the city. So here, so you've got all of this stuff going on, these bridge, this bridging, etc. And then here in this part of the city, you have this area, and it's the confluence, and it's the area where the prisons, the, san, senat, uh, the mental asylums, the prosti prostitution, swamps, meat works, you know, everything. Everything that the city didn't want to know about, but that was probably fundamental to its workings, was here. And it's been, it was an area which was, it was originally nothing, it was originally, a lot of it was Marrakesh or swamp, where the two rivers conver converged not so cleanly. And then over the years it had become a dump for rubbish, etc. And then of course it became industrial, etc. So along the edges of that were uh, a lot of industrial buildings, similar to the docks in Paris. And these were the docks with boats that would pull alongside and bring in. There's a major uh, agricultural region in, uh, around us here. And in the history of Lyon, they would be bringing in wheat, uh, you know, all of that kind of material, natural materials. And um, and um, etc. Into into these conditions. Okay. So if we move, sorry, up uh, here we uh, uh, won a competition for um, two two sites. One is called the Orange Cube, and the other is called the Green. Not not the Green Cube. We're still trying to come up with a name. <laughs> um, we call it the Green Parallelopid, but that's is a bit it's a, we, <laughs> it's a bit complex. Um, but the point is, uh, what's interesting here is that you have an old building called Les Salins, uh, which is the salt uh, storage facility. It's also called Les Toisages. And this was one of the old buildings we had to preserve. There's another one here, uh, which is uh, where, anyway, it was a, a major storage room. I'm just trying to remember. I think it was essentially wheat uh, was stored in it, which is now it just been opened as a, as, a, as a wonderful old building through here. Uh, this is new, and a couple of these, another one of these is old. So anyway, the, 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 the idea of this, massing-wise, was that we were in a new urban plan. The idea was that uh, to introduce, to keep some of the old buildings, introducing new program, programs into them, and then introducing new pieces of architecture occasionally between the old buildings and keeping at the same time a kind of missing teeth sequence, uh, which had a way of stitching together, uh, and I'll just go back for a second, this part of the site, which is one of the most 
amazing conditions in Europe, I think. I can only think of another one, which is in Prague, <coughs> where you have a condition of a, a highly urbanized condition, and you look across the water, and it's bucolic, uh, um, uh, you know, vin vineyards uh, and trees uh, and, and, and tiny sort of old churches and things falling down the slopes of a very steep slope condition. So you had this strange, weird 19th century industrial and just across the river was this stuff. So hence in the urban plan there was this idea of trying to link, bring the, gra the greenscape back and inform this area. Um, so hence these kind of missing teeth, and uh, in fact, uh, it's not a very good way of describing the landscape because of course I'm describing the architecture, but I'm just trying to allude to it. Um, our principle was to take uh, a, uh, a buildable envelope in this case to imagine uh, instead of the program that, that we were given for the completion was to do a series of uh, office floors as well as the bottom two floors which were cultural. We knew that uh, the envelope they gave us, we would have to introduce a vertical atrium into the building in order to make the office floors workable in terms of just pure light rules of having six or seven meters and then after that solid core or space you know, on the other half, a void on the other half. So what we did was we introduced, in fact, a much more complex void into the building, which was really the idea of putting the void horizontally um, but then what that led to was a tripartite void which wasn't built. Eventually what we did was we uh, developed it to being a simple cone. Uh, in, this kind of, in, this kind of, in, in this situation, uh, a, a double, a binary, a binary cone. So in this case what you see is the, is the cube, the system of the cube, uh, its matrix and uh, the uh, opening up of that light uh, demand into the building, which then, interestingly enough, we didn't need it on the, the mezzanine on the ground floor because these were no longer offices. So we knew that that light well we could only finish at this level. We wouldn't be driving it all the way through the building. So this led to then making the light well a deformed light well. So these are just uh, uh, simple uh, explanations as to how we pierced the, the cube and eventually ended up with, this is another story, this is a building we're, going, we're, we're building now, further along the river, and ended up with the, the cube. And uh, here's the old Salins building, the, the salt storage building. Here's the cube with its pierced uh, piece. This is uh, for the competition phase. This is the development of it. Um, what we went from was glass to a steel facade because the thermal rules changed on us during, from winning the competition to developing the building. And now we had to imagine the building is completely opaque. So we imagined it in it with hell because we thought we were gonna destroy the idea in a sense. And so we imagined the building is an opaque thing and actually by piercing it, introducing light through uh, tiny holes, could we not do the same thing? And I think and eventually we did that. All of the arguments about driving air uh, air freeways along the river, we started looking at, of course, because this was a driving force behind the idea that the hole could also act in a chimney effect and bring air up through the building in summertime. Uh, all the offices open onto that central well and they would, it would cool the office building down. So we have a very low level of mechanical uh, um, air conditioning in the building. The, the budget of that is brought way down by introducing these kinds of ideas, which are sustainable ideas, into the project. So it's a strange kind of condition. It operates for light, it operates for air movement, therefore in a sustainable way, um, and it operates as a gigantic window onto the river, but also back from the quay up through the building for the public. And of course gives people in the office spaces a place which is not in the office, it's outside the building, but it's not here on the street. And I think that's fundamental. You know, I think today we've, we, you know, it, as an office space, we don't have those kinds, we don't, we rarely have those kinds of spaces. Or we put people into, into 
um, you know, breakout spaces, or we find, you know, and, uh, and here, if you want to say, if you want to look for the breakout spaces, maybe the breakout spaces are actually exterior spaces, but within the building itself, which I think is interesting uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, kind of obvious, I think. Anyway, um, views around the building, the office floors, uh, the different problems of the site. Uh, this is the finished piece. This, this has become the most popular restaurant in Lyon. Uh, uh, it's a phenomenal success. Is a, this we did the interior of. It's a design uh, showroom. Again, very, very successful. And the headquarters of the developer who eventually moved into this uh, building, uh, the Orange Cube building. So here we're looking at the, you get a little bit of the sense of this landscape across the river. The site is phenomenal as a site. I mean, it's in summertime, it's just, uh, it's a lot more relaxing than Paris, let me put it that way. It's very, it's very pleasant to be there. And we have a 360-degree three, roof terrace you can walk around on top. Uh, so um, this is looking around the, the atrium space uh, on the edge looking out to the river. These are parts of the older industrial uh, past, of course, which were kept. The cranes coming out to the river. And views around that cone, all the floors being wood in this case. Uh, here's looking up, to the, uh, up through the oculus uh, space that take, drives air up through the building. And of course, windows, that, uh, tiny windows that look out into that oculus space because this is really, this is circulation space around the oculus. And then looking out through one of those windows, out to the river. And then looking across, you can see different... Now, we have the two top floors of the developer, but then there's a lawyer, there's a lighting, uh, lighting uh, designer as one floor. Um, anyway, so what's quite interesting about this space is that it becomes a kind of a cut through the building of sorts. So one the, the, the secondary issue, which is quite important, to talk about is that the, the, the primary thermal wall is the solid thing behind, and this thing, this screen, then acts uh, in a very important way environmentally. It cuts down solar intake into the building in summertime, reduces that quite, quite in quite an important manner, um, and at the same time, uh, the building is actually quite opaque. The secondary layer behind, layer behind is something like 60% or even higher in terms of its opacity the pixel. Um, but of course, the thing is about lighting calculations, which also let a light, enough light into the offices, and also are about letting views out. So there's a whole, um, you know, there's calculations that run back and backwards and forwards. This is a way of getting the firemen in, of course, incorporated into the facade. And this is the kind of view that one has from inside of the office looking out. Uh, all of the screens are uh, cut digitally, perforated manually, and then uh, all of this is digital cutting, the big ones. Uh, up on the terrace, the roof terrace. And looking down to the confluence area, this is an older building here. It's been restored in, inside the building. Uh, so the outside, of course, is visible. It's, a, it's part of that facade at night time. And looking back from the river, and then the, the wall, which we call the wall, uh, which, is a, which is the showroom. And in, in this case, we imagine the, the building is a kind of almost like a, a three-dimensional, uh, somehow kind of almost like a solidification of, of what we've been playing with, which was the, the river as a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of perforated uh, porous thing on the outside of the building. Here, what we wanted to do was uh, create 60 alveoli or 60 holes into which design objects would be placed. Uh, and these we call the islands, which become very interesting ways in which we can move these around. There's three modules that break this up. And uh, the, uh, the, in this case, the showroom can show different kinds of uh, room layouts on these islands. This is the wall. And it becomes completely flexible for the play of design objects. And then looking from outside in, OK. Um, the Ville Intelligent is, uh, is an exhibition that we were asked to produce in, for four days only. It's a bit crazy, in Lavalette. 
and we uh, built this thing. It's a structure, so a lightweight structure with a uh, with a Ferrari cloth on the inside face. So we re reversed the uh, normal role of of, uh, of of a skin on a building. Um, here we were asked for, uh, by the Orange Telephone Company to imagine Paris of the future. And so we took, uh, and into which this pavilion, they would for four, four days show the public prototypes of the future, the way in which communications are going, etc. That's hence the name Ville Intelligent, Intelligent City. And so we imagined in the plan of this thing a kind of new, kind of porous, uh, amoebic-like uh, Paris where arteries would run in and out of this structure. Uh, there's about five or six major entries. And it, you would have a periphery condition. And as you wandered into the scenography, it would be really more about a, a kind of um, like a city, like an urban state. Um, but I'm really going to only, sh I'm not going to really go into that. I'm really just going to go and going to show you the piece. Of course, it's, an, it's somehow an outtake of some of the interests that what we were doing with um, uh, with uh, the docks project, but in this case we, were we became for the first time very interested in, in skins and, and uh, much lighter weight skins. And of course, in this case, it's it's a temporary structure, which is quite fantastic because because you, you have a lot more lib uh, liberty with the kind of those kinds of rules in terms of designing skins for this kind of thing. So we uh, again imagine the skins is kind of stitched like a shoe uh, to the structure. And, uh, and this structure, uh, we hope, will travel around the world. It's demountable. It's mountable, demountable in a very short period of time. And will become really like a nomad piece that will travel around the world and exhibit Villa Intelligent in different places of the world. Um, so the first place was Bernard, Bernard Chumi's uh, Lavalette uh, this year. OK. Uh, frack. So I'm going to end here. This is the end. <laughs> Um, I hope it's, I've told enough stories, that's all. Anyway, um, the stories somehow are also, uh, uh, somehow they are, there's an allusion to gossip, you know, so I don't know if I've been gossipy enough. But, uh, but at least I think I've tried to tell the stories or the making of each piece and, w and what it led to. Um, uh, gossip has more to do with the funny things that happened along the way, and maybe the accidents and things like that. Uh, maybe I'm a bit tired to think of all of that. But the thing is that uh, here we're in Orléans on a, on, a, on, a, on a really, really wonderful project, I hope, anyway. We're in the process of uh, finishing construction of it. Uh, it's for an institution called the, uh, the FRAC, which is the Fonds Régional d'Art uh, Contemporain. Uh, so that it's the it's um, fond, which is the the what, I guess it's like it's not a, like a bank, but anyway, it's it's a, it, they a foundation in some ways, in some ways of uh, contemporary art. This was a system. This not this building really, but the system was set up uh, with the idea of decentralization that went on in France in the early 80s. That the arts would be the the financing of the arts would be dis decentralized from Paris and would go out to places like Bordeaux, Lyon, different cities, and even smaller cities, where small institutions would get the financial backing that could give them the possibility of creating new collections. And it was an amazing situation. I think it was Lang, again, that set this up, uh, being the creative force that he was uh, under Mitterrand, I think. And uh, uh, anyway, Orléans benefited from an idea of a frac. Uh, and in this case, what they did was they wanted to put together an architecture collection. And they decided, the people that were behind it were people like Frederick Migaro and others, that decided to create a collection of uh, utopian architecture and post-1945. So that was the, the premise of the collection, or is still the premise of the collection. And it is the third most important collection of architecture models and drawings in the world today. The only downside of all of that is that it has never really been exhibited. It's never been exhibited in France. It's been exhibited a few times around the world. 
Um, it's never been exhibited in America, I think, and it's really one of the great collections of the world. And they got into collecting uh, very, very early on, before you know, prices and things went sky high, and before the French government had less and less money. So there was a kind of good... Uh, and so what happened here was that they were given by the city uh, for like one uh, uh, un centime, uh, I think, you know, like one cent, the usual story, this site, which is a military site where they uh, made food, you know, like Petite Curie, uh, and it's called the Substance, Substance Militaire. And they made food here and I think, I believe, the 19th century, uh, 19th, 20th century, it was cooking for the military. When we, we if you know Orleans, Orleans has a thing called the Maze, which is like a big major road that comes down to the Loire River here. And it is like a big loop that runs around the city. You have the train stations and all the sort of 19th century entry into the, into the center in the north. And then you have this thing called the, the May. The May you can walk along and it has, a, uh, it has roads on either side and it's a park, a little bit like Commonwealth somehow. And uh, what is quite wonderful about the, well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful aspect of the thing. All of these buildings along this edge, though, are very, were very closed, were, ver were never really, uh, the gesture was never really, I think, developed uh, so much in terms of these buildings on either side. They were much more closed, much more, uh, I mean, the interests were what, military, uh, industrial, you know, so they're not about in institutions that were opened up to the public in the 19th century. So, so in, in, anyway, hence, uh, in this part of the uh, history, uh, there was an old building here, which for the f one of the first times in our work, we proposed in the competition to destroy. It was the latest building in the site, but still very strange, because we normally keep. <laughs> But there's a time and a place to destroy something in order to make something better. And that's an important moment to know when to do it and when not to do it. And I think that's also something to say about history, because not all history is great. Some history just never worked, right? You know, I mean, it's not, it's obvious to say that. It's not so un unobvious. But it's not obvious when it comes to the level of a city to make a decision like that. Or a big group of people consensually to decide to do that. It mostly just doesn't happen. And so, I mean, what's interesting in France is there are a lot of competitions, and maybe you do have a voice only at that moment in doing the competition to say, I'll do this. I know I may fail, but I'll propose it because it's what I believe in. And the building was blocking completely the boulevard here, and we knew in their brief, they said, we want the building to open onto this. Well, they didn't use the word open, but they said we wanted it to be visible. Well, the only way of making it visible, anyway, is destroying it. And yet, you know, we knew later, there was, a, there was a, a lot of people, anyway, later when we talked to the jury and stuff like that, they said, well, you know, everyone was sort of horrified at first at the idea of destroying. So there was these, you know, fighting uh, interests about the project. Anyway, the point is, by destroying the piece, we proposed this new extension, which becomes the entry into these buildings, this had, had been run for a number of years like a biennale of architecture inside these ones. And, uh, and the program was really, really about building an extension, which we, which we did uh, in this part of the site. And we, cr and we created three kinds of uh, pieces, which we called le turbulence. And the turbulence comes from this principle that in the 18th century building here, and these 19th century buildings here, you had three conditions, uh, um, or t basically two, I should say, two conditions, two um, uh, matrix conditions that come together. And in doing so, we knew that the uh, third condition that we would be making was this, which was about not only resolving the geometric problem on the side, but actually uh, making something out of it. Uh, and making something out of it was somehow creating this condition which had to do with a kind of welling up or a, a deformation of what we imagined was this whole space. And so the architecture is very ambiguous as to where it begins, whether it's a 19th, 20th century thing, whether it's the, the, the space, the public space, or whether it's actually this deformation that creates this new public entry. Anyway, this, these are just diagrams uh, going through the building. 
Here you can see a little bit about the ground floor and the way the piece works. So this is all the existing condition, of course. This is the new. The entry is here. There's a, uh, what they call a gallery of actuality for very uh, quick exhibits in this area. Uh, there's a gallery of uh, virtual art in this area, virtual architecture. Uh, here we have a bookshop uh, and cafe and things like this. In this area, we, in these areas, we have uh, a permanent, uh, sorry, temporary gallery, which is absolutely fantastic. It's about five meters high. Again, this is like five and a half meters high. This is, uh, uh, again, uh, temporary exhibits. Then in the back there will be a landscape, a piece by a landscape architect, which I hope is kind of like a gallery of landscape. We'll see if that happens. Uh, meaning that you know we can rotate exhibits of uh, you know landscape through the site. These are higher levels views around the project. Uh, these are views w during the um, competition phase. So this, uh, this becomes kind of the major signal piece over the boulevard, the video, the, 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 the bookshop volume, etc. cetera. Um, and then we worked uh, on the competition also with uh, artists because we're very interested in the art world. We try and keep up quite a strong dialogue with it. And the artists we worked with here are, are called Electronic Shadows and they've become quite famous in France, we're working with a new electronic media, um, but in a very, in very interesting ways. And in this uh, intervention, they imagined the, uh, the skin as a, as a, as a, as a completely programmable uh, interactive face. And uh, there, but it wouldn't just be a skin, you know, operating in any uh, manner. I don't know if we, I don't think I have images of that, but anyhow, anyhow. The skin is broken down into points, lines, and surfaces, and they actually want to get back into the idea, the very idea of representation uh, through light now. And that, I think, is going to be very interesting. So we're going right back into the idea of, um, like what we had with a pencil, how we, how we, you know, how we'd start with a point, a line, and filling in the, the, the thing to create a surface, and how, that's, how that comes about, well, how representation, representation, that's really at the heart of making somehow representation. Anyway, the surface of the building will be very much about playing with this, these ideas. Uh, they have designed, therefore, a program which becomes the, the digital media surface. It will be interactive, but it will, it will really become like an, an interface with an art piece that exists, a light art piece imagined by an author that exists. And that's really interesting. Um, so we're quite excited about working that way. These are some models which I know I talked to you when you came through Paris. I call them skeleton models. We've been doing them a fair bit lately where we're able to show the concept as well as the, uh, the, the in the sense, they're volumetric, but they're also uh, uh, conceptual. All the conceptual ideas are in those models. Skeleton being in the sense that you can see through them. You, you understand in a way the workings of the project. The stereolithic, of course, and we've been doing similar uh, things with drawings. Um, this is something to do with it. This is one of the images produced by the, the Electronic Shadows group. Uh, some working drawings, some depleted faces of that. Uh, it's the first project where our builder is producing everything in 3D. Crazy, which is great. So the interface between our office and the office producing not only the structure, because he, uh, he is a, a builder of primarily a builder of primary structure, but then companies under him are producing everything to do with the skins on the inside and the outside. So he's like a, he's like a general contractor, uh, but he's, he's doing the synthesis of in 3D, which we have had to do. Thing that our office has produced today. This is just a tiny uh, moment uh, of, of those models. And these, of course, are all about you know, holding up different skins, the structure as it's built, piece of the, uh, the structure that was built. All of it was built in a workshop on the east of France and then all put together and then 
taken apart, put on a truck, and then re-put together on the site. And it had to be done that way because it was just too complex. We could not deliver the pieces and then cross our fingers. And then on the site, uh, there's been, I mean, what's incredible is that to learn the process of building these things is remarkably complex because you do need uh, surveyors to come in. If you've had some experience in building these kinds of structures, you need surveyors to come in at special moments throughout, <coughs> special is not the word, but you need surveyors to come in through at least three times throughout the construction phase just to survey using 3D surveying techniques. So I don't know if any of you have been doing that, but it's really interesting. So what you produce are uh, three-dimensional x-rays of the, build, the architecture that you're making, and then everything's cross-referenced. So, and you need to do that at least three times. So anyway, that's been a whole a technique that we've been developing just during the building of this. We didn't even know about that beforehand and to convince then uh, the companies to go back in and invest at that level, of course, it's complex, right? Because it involves money and who pays, and, you know, and it's time. But anyway, luckily we have um, a group of people that really want to do something special here. So these are the old, these are images of the uh, old building. So we've been restoring the interiors. You can see there are uh, fantastic spaces uh, to work with proportionally, uh, leaving all of these beams with their brick infill arches, etc., restoring them, bringing them back to what mm, hopefully w w that, uh, it'll be something quite, uh, quite, quite good. Um, and then different, this is the 19th century part. That was the, uh, uh, an earlier part that I was showing. Um, the video pavilion part that was being built as it goes up, the primary tower as it goes up. This is one of the spaces I was showing to you, uh, which we should have major installation pieces here, which are, were, I think it's going to be quite an exciting space with the <coughs> landscape and then the courtyard here, and these windows open both ways. And we hope to be doing Architecture Biennale here also. Uh, Ashi Lab will be run here in the future, which is really an, a very exciting world event for architecture. Um, so we will get that back to this site. And they have a very important pedagogic program. So they, will want, they're, they are starting uh, little kids off with the big question of what is architecture. And so there's a whole workshop and a space just for very young kids. Um, here, as well as it, it will be linked in with the whole series. It's already linked in with schools, but it w they want to develop the whole pedagogic side of architecture with this, uh, with this, with this uh, project. So these are, these are, this is where we're starting to skin the thing. This is inside some of the structure with the different ocular spaces, the scenographic aspects to it uh, as we're putting the skin on it. And this is just recently, maybe in about uh, three weeks ago. And that's it. Cashieri Lectureship in Humanities. Um, it's the first one that has been really uh, a collaborative effort with the current students and the alumni to invite someone that they had met and were interested in hearing more about. And uh, I was thinking about the confluence, not just a meal, mm -hmm. but also uh, <laughs> of, other of, of the kind of conceptual subtraction that a lot of the work is, volumetric uh, removal which is true of the work of Dean Cashieri, right? That mm -hmm. he's constantly working in subtractive mode in all of his processes that you can mm -hmm. see in the library. Mm -hmm. but well done. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> all right, so um, it's my honor with Julia Halibi, I hope she'll come here and help, uh, you know, knight. Knight. We have this uh, okay. beautiful uh, medallion, which on one side is the VAC seal, and on the other, Cashieri 20, the Lectureship in Humanities Stories, Histoire, Brennan McFarlane, Great. March 29th, wow. that's 2012. That's for, that's so we expect you to wear this for the next six days. I <laughs> <laughs> I
I will wear it in bed. It's great. It's fantastic. It's great. Thank, thank, thank you so much for this. It's fantastic because I thought, well, you know, that's really, that's really nice. It's, it looks like a beautiful medallion. And then when you turned it over, and I thought, well, ah, 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 you know, maybe it's one of these things that's produced, you know, bo no, no. boxes of them. No, no. Not at all. You know, it says in uh, Kassar Electric. <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic. In, it's great. It's, in, it's impressed into yes. the thing, in the humanity, stories, histoire. That's great. Good. Super. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. So very nice. Beautiful. Super. Thank you. Sure. Okay. That's great. So, really uh, super. Pardon me. We have time for, I think, two questions, because I know uh. it's getting late. <laughs> um, is there someone who's got a question? Saul. So you have these very complex structures, which are very beautiful. What yep. software do you use, and have you had to uh, write special programs in order to make the best use of the software? It's interesting. These? Yeah, we. I mean, well, there we are. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Giving a really technological answer. Uh, uh, we and we do a lot of scripting, you know, because we are interested in. So we're. Uh, I mean, that's obvious because we're interested in systems. So the scripting, of course, is really interesting for that. Um, uh, we work, uh, you know, our, the way our, we have not been uh, working with, you know, we haven't been inventing any softwares, it's true. Uh, we work a lot with uh, Rhino, Reno, uh, uh, because it's such an easy modeler and uh, it's light and it becomes, what's interesting is we've sort of t tended to work back it, from how the people building our buildings are what they're using. And so Rhino has been one of the biggest, the easiest interfaces. And again, it's in Fr France, so I don't know really what the situation in America is like, but in France, uh, the people building buildings now are getting more and more into Rhino. So that's really interesting. So, well, it's interesting. It's, it's the, e the easiest way of us to interface using that. So we tended to be using Rhino a lot, uh, vector works. I mean, we go through all of, the, all of the stuff, but I would say the primary model is Rhino. And then a lot of scripting. More and more. <laughs> yes. uh, one of the challenges we as students face is trying to take advantage of the benefits of computers, yep. as well as the more tactile uh, processes of sketching and physical model making. Um, clearly the computer is crucial to your work. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the more tangible processes and how you use those? Tangible as in sort of the hands-on. Yeah. yeah, tangible, yeah. So, because um, it's interesting, tangible for me is almost a computer today too, you know, but anyway. <laughs> um, well, that's why I was saying it's almost political to put up a sketch. It's not, it's crazy, you know, because people still sketch and they still make models. And I think the, the thing that is really important for us is that we found that it depends, it, I mean, th these are kind of, it's not a lame answer, it's an obvious answer, but it's not so obvious in a way. We found the best method is to uh, look at the, work with the project, see what the project needs. And some projects demand a lot of sketching by hand and then going into modeling it and on the computer. Other projects actually are really interesting to work immediately in models and just making volumetric real models and then maybe going back into sketching and then going back into the, going into the computer and then maybe coming back into models for different reasons. In other words, the reasons lead to the, me the tangible, well, the, the, the methods come out of the reasons. And the projects really define the, the methods. And by, because of that, I think it's really important that students should not be frozen at all. They're not. But they shouldn't be frozen with the idea that they should work across all of the mediums. I think the future is about moving, being able to move across all sorts of mediums to make architecture. It has to be. I think it's really, really important. Because I think we've come through a period where we felt that only by making it through uh, informatic uh, means somehow one could prove something. But in fact, I think, it's, uh, I think it's not, the arguments are not there. The arguments are in the ideas and the intentions or what's, in a way, what's needed. And the forms of expression, they can be varied, you know? So I don't know if that's a helpful 
answer to your, uh, your question. I mean, it's an obvious, to me, it's an obvious one, but I think it's a very important question because it's, uh, you know, obviously, it's very, it's a very contemporary question in a way. It's an ongoing one too, you know, because one's uh, we've be become so interested in the means of representation, right? In the last uh, ten years of education and, and the making of architecture, the, the means of uh, representation are the primordial. Maybe, mo maybe more than ever, because we have more and more means at our disposal, and so the primary question is what is better becomes uh, a question. But I would say it, 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 that should be generated from each project. Yeah. That's the second question. Uh, <laughs> How do you maintain uh, the scope of the project from conceptual to finish without it changing from the concept? Do you have a, 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 a lawyer? Or <laughs> I mean, how, like, how do I you, like without it being value engineered, how does it stay from concept to finish, like so immaculately? You know, I could really be, you know, I think you'd like an answer with a lot of bloody hard work. I don't think it's anything, it comes down to anything else. I love the question of maybe a lawyer. The, well, you didn't say it, well, it through a lawyer, maybe, but still, it was a beautiful uh, diversion. I think you lose money with lawyers uh, and time. And, uh, and, architect and architecture is not about lawyers. It can't be. It's creative, you know. I mean, screw lawyers, really. They, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't be near architecture. <laughs> <laughs> Rich. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm tired. <laughs> um, no, I don't. It's interesting because you, you asked this question. In fact, uh, we went to dinner last night, and you asked a question which is like, "Well, what would you like? What would be your idea?" It wasn't the word "ideal." What would you like to do? You know, what would be an interesting program? And I said I would like to do things more in the humanities. You know what I mean? Related more to being useful somehow. You know. Uh, but I think that's, it's a complicated answer. It's a very complicated answer because in a way to be useful, where are you, you, you know, when do you decide you're useful and not useful? And when do you decide architecture, what you make, is having an impact in a very necessary way or not? It's a complicated one. You know, can I say that the George has less impact because less, there's not so many people that can afford to have a dinner there, right? And yet uh, it ended up having a big impact on a lot of people, and not just people that could afford to eat there, you know what I mean? So those are kind of, they're complex uh, questions. And yet at the same time, um, uh, you know, we're designing a number of schools right now. Or, you know, which I think is really interesting, because I'm interested in this idea that students can get to benefit from architecture, right? And their environments. I think that's fantastic, you know? So th those are the kinds of areas that I want to move into more. And uh, what would I, there was another thing in my m mind, but anyway. But it's kind of that general direction, you know, which I think is, which I think is important, sure. You know, it's, ma it's making architecture more uh, somehow, uh, it, uh, it, it, it can answer to more and more problems in the world. Because I think there's so many basic problems in the world, which are huge and uh, seemingly unsurmountable. And if architecture can't help, uh, solve some of those, then I think it's a lost cause. So I think it's really important that we try, as architects, to, to, to try and work more and more in those, in those areas that uh, is, it's necessary. It's complicated, though, because as an architect, you're, you're some, you're, you wait for stuff to come to you in some ways. In fact, in a lot of ways, it is like that. So it's complicated where you want to go and where you can go, right? They're two different things. But, I, you, but you kind of work at it. And I think if you work at it long enough, I think the stuff gradually comes there. But anyway, that's the, that's the, the, the answer to your question. With that, we're going to give a friendly break. 
And uh, <laughs> there is a reception downstairs. Please, the installation is in progress, so if you come see the gallery exhibit today, we invite you back in another three days, you'll see more. Uh, but please come downstairs. Thanks. So much.